Hey folks, Dr. Jeff Williams with Creekstone Integrated Care right here in Amarillo, Texas. And I want to share a bit of information with you this week. Some information that maybe you're not going to believe in the beginning. What I want to share with you is the fact that bending forward is for the birds, not humans. So the research strongly suggests that bending at the waist, bending forward at the waist, is not the best thing for you. Sit-ups, straight-legged deadlifts, and something as simple as bending over to pick up a pencil off of the floor in the morning, those things are likely doing you more harm than they're doing you good. To help you understand why myself, as well as back pain experts around the globe are saying this, well, let me try to set the stage for you just a little bit first. Now, the first thing is, did you know that the most common reason for a person under the age of 50 years old to have back pain, the most common reason is because of a disc injury? Up to 40%, in fact, of the low back pain cases that come through any clinic's doors, those are actually low back disc pain patients right off the top, 40% of them. Through the research literature, we know that 40% of back pain cases are disc injuries. And knowing that, well, it makes sense that it would be beneficial to us to also know the most common ways of injuring discs, right? Then maybe we can avoid them. The most common way to injure a disc is by applying load when the back is not properly braced or prepared for the load. Many times people just do things without thinking about them or preparing themselves for the movement or the activity. We can use core bracing techniques and movement biomechanics to help give us an advantage and prevent putting our lower back at disadvantageous positions. We're building your knowledge here a little bit, a little bit at a time, so keep stick with me. Next thing is, when a disc actually does get injured, the most likely way it injures is to bulge or herniate toward the back, towards your back. They don't typically bulge or herniate towards the sides or towards your stomach. They almost always bulge or herniate towards the back because that is where the disc is the thinnest. That's simply how we were created. That is the weak point of the disc so that's how it usually happens with disc injuries. Now consider that the disc is really like a really strong bag of water. If I have a bag of water in front of me and I push on the right side of the bag, well the left side is going to bulk up, right? If I push on the front side of the bag, well then the back side bulks up. See what I mean? Now if discs almost always push through the back side of the disc and the disc is like a bag of water, well then you can start to understand why bending forward is for the birds. When we bend forward, we pinch or push down the front of the disc and we push all of the force and contents towards the back of the disc, which is, like I said, the weak part of the disc. It's only a matter of time before the disc begins to have signs of failure. It can begin weakening by developing small cracks that allow the contents to weasel through and push further and further toward the outer edge. Eventually, something as simple as bending over to grab a pencil off of the floor can be the straw that broke the camel's back if it's not done correctly. And when we talk about protecting your back from a disc injury, well, the first thing we want to say is that you desperately need to limit trunk flexion activities. Activities basically that bring your knees towards your chest. Those activities are inherently risky if you are not properly trained to do them or you do them excessively or over and over repetitively and consistently. Next, we got to know life is about movement and movement often includes trunk flexion. It's a fact of life. It's something that cannot be completely avoided and I'm well aware of that. For this reason, it's important to learn to brace for load and to brace yourself for activity. Imagine someone is about to punch you in the stomach and you brace your abdomen to absorb the blow. That kind of bracing is what I'm talking about. You do not want to brace for a boxing match though, like you would brace to pick up a pencil, right? 
wouldn't make sense. The amount of abdominal bracing you should do in preparation for an activity, well, that bracing should match the activity. Proper bracing in preparation for loader activity is vital. Now your lumbar spine, your low back, in particular, wants and desires a strong, neutral, stable, stiff posture. If you twist at the low back, you are at a disadvantage. If you bend forward at the waist and apply flexion to your, to your low back, your spine is at a disadvantage. And you must move through life and activity as if you have a fluorescent light bulb taped to your back and your job is to keep the light bulb from breaking. And I want to thank Dr. Tim Bertelsman from Cairo Up for that visual. It's perfect. When you pick up something from the ground, use the short stop stance, keeping the low back nice and straight and using your hips and knees to accomplish the lion's share of the work. When you open a heavy door, don't twist at the waist and pull the door back that way. Don't twist at the waist. Use your shoulders and your arms to accomplish the task rather than your back. Keeping the low back in a nice, neutral, and strong position goes a long way towards protecting it long term. Now here's another tip for you to protect your back. When we sleep at night, our discs take on water. They rehydrate to an extent. And when we get up in the morning, the discs in our spine are fatter and tighter and they're more full than they were when we went to bed. As we apply weight bearing, gravity starts to do its work. We apply weight bearing by standing up, right? So as we're standing up and moving around and bouncing around and walking and doing what we do, well, gravity starts working. And over the course of the next hour to an hour and a half, the discs reduce back to the size that they will remain for the rest of the day. Now knowing this, it makes sense that many disc injuries happen in the morning. They can also happen after having sat in one place for an extended amount of time, such as a long car drive. Getting out and, uh, and starting to be active too quickly can be detrimental. People allow their discs to fatten up from inactivity and then start being active immediately without having given them time to reduce back down to normal. And did you know that sitting is the most pressure you can put on your low back discs? Well, actually that's not completely true. Bending forward and picking something of substance with weight and then sitting up with it, that's about as bad as you can get. Not only are you sitting and bending forward, which puts your back at a disadvantage and pushes all of the disc contents towards the back where the disc is the weakest, but you've also applied weight or load to the whole situation. And I bring this up only because you can visit literally any gym in the world and you can see this scenario played out repeatedly, all day, every day. Now, at this point, you know some things about low back discs. You know that they are the most common injuries for those under 50 years old. You know how they are most commonly injured. You know the mechanism of the injury and you know how to give yourself a better chance of avoiding the disc injury in the first place. But what about if injury has already occurred? Well, then what can you do about it? And there's several different paths one can take in treating a lumbar disc herniation. In fact, the most common thing that comes to mind for patients when they hear about having a lumbar disc herniation is that disc bulges and disc herniations require surgery, right? And while that may be true for a select few cases, in the large majority of cases, it's just not true. About 56 million people suffer from low back pain at any one time, and only about 5% of those sufferers actually require any sort of back surgery at all. If your reflexes, your sensation, and motor functions are even from side to side, well, then it's likely that your case probably doesn't require surgery at all. If you have no alteration in bowel or bladder function and no numbness or tingling in, in any area underneath or between your legs and thighs, basically anything that would touch a saddle. if if there's no numbness or tingling going on there, well then surgery is probably not, not warranted. 
These are the most common reasons for surgery. The American College of Physicians came out a few years ago with updated recommendations for treating acute and chronic low back pain. Assuming the complaint isn't an emergency or immediately surgical, well, the recommendations are as follows. Your first line therapies that are backed by evidence and should be used first are spinal manipulative therapy. You know what that is? That's chiropractic, spinal manipulative therapy. Exercise, massage, acupuncture, low level laser, also known as cold laser, uh, yoga, tai chi, cognitive behavioral therapy, and heat are some of the first line therapies. Let's say that doesn't work out. Second line therapies include NSAIDs such as Tylenol, Aspirin, or Ibuprofen. Then let's say that fails, then you would look more at uh, prescription medication with consultation because we are becoming more and more aware of what opioids, uh, what dangers come with opioids. When everything else has failed, it makes sense to explore more invasive options such as epidural steroid injections and maybe ultimately surgery. But after, after everything else has failed, too often the last and final and permanent option is flip-flopped to the top of the list when it's not typically the best first answer. When a patient goes to an evidence-based, patient-centered chiropractic office and they undergo spinal decompression, low-level laser, McKinsey exercises, spinal manipulative therapy, um, my office also has acupuncture and massage in addition to all of that stuff. When, when patients who thought that they were permanently harmed do all of these things, they are many times literally just blown away by how effective the treatments can be when they're all combined into a smart strategic protocol. Discs can respond to just laying on your stomach or taking a walk sometimes. Disc herniations can be treated effectively and they can be treated successfully with no surgery, no medication, and no invasive therapies. Disc herniations and disc bulges are not stuck that way and it's important to know that. Patients aren't stuck in pain forever typically. Disc herniations have a history of being somewhat short-lived and a well-trained chiropractor or physical therapist can usually speed up that healing many times and they can get you better faster. Because let's face it, nobody has time for pain. We have too many things to do in our lives. Like go bird watching, for example. <laughs>